Hola y bienvenidos a la Deuces Wild Daily Hustle. Soy Enrique Barnes y presidente de esa mejor cerveza. Y Deadwater son los mejores bebidas. No abate por No Filter Network. Will the Thrill Clark, not with us this morning, but will be with us this evening. And, of course, Miguelito San Dieguito, not here. We don't know where exactly his whereabouts are. But each and every single morning, we come on here on the DH. We properly salute our boys. Yes, 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 yes. Woo. Remember this, folks? When we are juiceful, we are useful. And when we are juiceless we are fucking useless that's right a very pleasant good morning to each and every one of you on this 12th day of december 2023 we are brought to you by bet online that's right the holiday season is off and rolling with the nfl in full stride and the nba and nhl hitting mid-season form Bet online is your number one destination for all your sports wagering info with up to the minute wagering news, odds, trends, predictions. Bet online is the top spot for everything pro and amateur sports and not just the big four. Bet online has info available at your fingertips with both desktop and mobile access at any time for almost any sport that is played from MMA to international soccer. And we don't know what else exactly you can bet on. Youth baseball to frogs fucking whatever. Head to bet online today. And remember to use the promo code BLEAV. Capital B. L. E. A. V. For your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online where the game starts. Also, don't forget about our partners at KT Tape. Get yourself some of the Pro Oxygen Tape by hitting the QR code in the upper right-hand corner. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, nor did I stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. But I can tell you through experience, this shit works. When you apply the tape, it lifts the skin, promotes blood flow to the area, thus reducing inflammation and pains associated with it. KT Tape deflaming muscles since its creation you also want to go for the deflammation process try one of the foot reflexology boards over at ericburns.com e-r-i-c-b-y-r-n-e-s dot c-o-m we are running low the christmas season always gets us We have a few more left. They're perfect stocking stuffers. Something you can give your bestie, give a coworker, buy a bunch of them, hand it out to all your coworkers, clients, whatever. Foot reflexology is thousands of years old. You step on the board. It promotes blood flow to certain areas. And like I said, it works. Lastly, to focus for this show, I got myself this shot of greatness right here. Verge. (laughs) A little lemon, a little cannabis. You mix it up with some honey, and it is soothing Mm, on the throat. Cheers, everybody. Ah, Happy, happy Tuesday. Okay, let's go to today's daily hustle. And then we will get into Shohei Otani, Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, all sorts of incredible news. I mean, what a weekend it was for sports. And by the way, the let them play 12U baseball team. Big round of applause. Way to finish it off. We went down to Huntington Beach this weekend. Boys played their asses off. We ended up going 5-0, and going into the championship game and dropped a tough one we were at the ballpark for 16 hours on sunday and i'm not making excuses never would it was a long fucking day 
but the kids battled their asses off. We gave up some runs and pool play, got a lower seed than we should have gotten. And then that forced us to play four games on Sunday. The first being at eight o'clock in the morning, the next at two, the next at six. And the championship was at eight, which really didn't start till nine. It's just, it was an absolute fucking grind. So, um, and then breaking news, I just saw I lost 115 to 113 in fantasy. Gosh, damn it. Ah, makes me want to throw up right there. Okay, let's get into today's daily hustle. Choose wisely. Buenos dias. Today is Tuesday, December 12, 2023. And we now officially are less than two weeks till Christmas. On that note, the place is here. The time is now to order your 10 favorite family members and 10 best easy team go hard foot reflexology board. Like I mentioned to you guys right before this, reflexology is thousands of years old and essentially hits trigger points of the feet that increase blood flow throughout the body, which decreases inflammation and helps alleviate pain. Disclaimer, as I tell you guys each and every single morning, not a doctor, not a scientist, but I stand on the board for 7 to 15 minutes a day and it works. Go to ericburns.com now to get the Daily Hustler special offer and pick up a few effortless and Daily Hustle 222 books when you are there too. Our current supply of both the books and the footboards is low. And when they're gone, they're gone. Daily Hustle quote of the day. We will be the same person each year with the exception of the books we read and the people we spend our time with. Choose wisely. Daily Hustle translation. Our education and our environment, including the people we spend our time with, are the two biggest determining factors in who we ultimately become as individuals. The good thing is that each day we wake up, we have a choice for as far as what content we decide to consume and who we hang with. It's pretty simple. Make choices that we know will enhance our lives. Today on the Daily Hustle Live Interactive Video Pod on NoFilter.net, we're going to discuss Shohei Otani, brilliantly, how he brilliantly manipulated the system. And the real reason why Patrick Mahomes lost his shit after losing to the Bills on Sunday. But wait, there's more. We got a brand new edition of Deuces Wild with Will the Thrill Clark tonight. No Filter Network where we can discuss Giants post Otani plans. Off-season hitting drills, and of course, we will be ripping packs of 1987 tops. I mean, the most beautiful baseball cards you've really ever seen. There's something about the wood border to these bad boys that just give me that nostalgia feeling. And I have a little click pick below to check out a pretty cool montage of the 12U LTP fall season that concluded this weekend. Made a reel on this this morning. It's not something that's going to go viral by any means. But if you're into youth baseball, if you're an LTP supporter, some really awesome pictures over the course of the fall season that I think encap- encapsulates you know, everything we're about and whatnot. But... Boys finished number one in the country according to the PG point system. And it wasn't even close. We had 2,350 points, I believe. No, it was 2,310. The next closest was like 1,500. So there was a huge gap. And then there was a bunch that were in that 12 to 1,500 range. How you get points is playing big tournaments. So you go to a big tournament and you do well in a big tournament. It's great. We won three big ones. And we finished second in two other gigantic ones. So those were big point getters. That's how we were able to pull it off. I do think we're one of the best teams in the country. It's hard pressed to say we're the best. It just depends what teams put together on what weekend. The Banditos are the reigning national champs. To be the champs, you got to beat the champs. But they didn't play this fall. Very rarely. I'm sure their guys played. But they played up at 13 U Majors, one tournament. They won that. But I don't think there was a whole lot else that they did. So it'll be interesting when the final rankings actually do come out for the fall to see how PG decides to play this one 
And I, I don't really care either way. I just know that our boys went out there. We played ball this fall. Weren't afraid to the best tournaments against the best teams. And overall, just had a, a fantastic season. So, okay. Let's get into Shohei Otani. The, uh, the first article here of the day is 17 questions about the Otani deal. And I mean, obviously that's a lot of questions, but when the deal broke, it was shocking to say the least because we had expected Otani through all the rumors to go to Toronto. The whole time, though, it just didn't make sense to me. So as I looked at this, I'm like, man, why the fuck would Otani want to go to Toronto? He lives in Orange County. By all accounts, he enjoyed his experience in Southern California. The Dodgers are right there. He can drive, have a driver take him, take a helicopter, like whatever. I get it that LA traffic sucks and everything else, but it was head scratching that the Toronto Blue Jays would also be able to outbid Otani. So what happened was all these rumors started circulating around Otani. And they were tracking a private plane that actually was headed from John Wayne Airport in Orange County to Toronto with everybody expecting Otani to be on that plane. John Paul Morrissey actually reported it. Very credible insider in the Major League Baseball world. Well, it turns out Otani wasn't even on the fucking plane. It was a Toronto businessman's plane. And as they tried to connect the dots everywhere, guess what? They didn't fucking connect. So at this point, Otani created such a shit show because he didn't exactly come out to stop any of these rumors about signing with Toronto. He just let it go and go and go and go, and rightfully so. The Dodgers, in the meantime, decide, holy shit, we better up our offer. So they come back. Whatever the offer was before, who knows? It skyrockets to 700 large. And they got their guy. What a fucking brilliant move by Otani and his agent. It was incredible. And then to defer all that money to a much later date. Well, now you are giving the Dodgers a chance to compete where he's not just hogging the payroll. So it also allows them to stay under that luxury tax threshold. And then later on, Otani's going to get his, and I don't know. I mean, I've got a good chance he could be dead by then, and it'll be his kids or his kids' kids, and it just go on and on and on. But what the fuck does he care? He's making $50 off the field anyway through endorsements. So taking a salary of just $2 million a year and deferring $68 million of that to a later date, I also think has huge tax benefits to it because it's not going to be in fucking California anymore. Anyhow, I, the whole thing was shocking and incredibly intelligent. I got to believe. I don't know the tax rules. I don't know all of the luxury tax rules when it comes to the Dodgers 
and dealing with that. I have no idea what this would mean for the Dodgers down the road when they are paying the 68 large, if that's going to work against their luxury tax bill, you know, whenever it ends. I think that payments, the entire time he, he's with the Dodgers, so it's 10 years, he's not going to get more than $2 million bucks. Two, 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 two. So, look, let's get into the questions of Otani. Because it, th- this is, hold on a second. This is one of those things where I texted Ken Rosenthal the other night when I figured out that Otani wasn't on the plane. And I actually said, I said, Ken, have you ever seen this many reports of misinformation in your life from credible writers? And he said, no, never, never have. That's how well Otani's camp fooled everybody. If you looked at Ken's timeline, Ken didn't report shit. He stayed very low pro on this. And he just reported facts. He was reporting about other trades in that process. So Henry and Joe... If I get to this text, and then we have a lot of back and forth going on. But one of the things that he sent, all you know, all about the Otani deal, yada yeah. I think it's right here. Okay. So this was a tweet from Brandon Wilde. It said, so putting all the Otani pieces together, it looks like Otani hoped to land with the Dodgers. It was reported early. He knew where he wanted to go. Gave them a chance for a final offer. His agent likely initially was not getting the money he wanted. Someone Otani's in Otani's camp leaked that he was signing with the Blue Jays and he was traveling to Toronto. After those leaks, Dodgers thought they might lose him and came in with a final offer. This is from Tom Verducci. On Friday, reports broke that Otani signing was imminent and that he was headed to Toronto to sign with the Blue Jays. The report was completely erroneous. The Dodgers didn't know that. They held meetings Friday night with an air of worry. The rumors were likely false. They decided, but they still created angst amongst the L.A. executives. Quote, you just don't know, says one of the Dodgers executives when asked Friday about the Friday night meeting. That's the best way to describe it. We just didn't. No, it was not a comfortable feeling. You know, got to keep your cards close to your vest, baby. Do not show your hand. Oh, my goodness. What do you think the Dodgers offer was? 600? The report about him signing with Toronto... I believe was like in that 590 area. I'd heard San Francisco had come up to 600. It wasn't 700. We know that. They also had a plan the whole time, no matter who he ended up with, about figuring out how to work the finances. Because when you're making 50-something large, you don't need the fucking money. You just don't need it. At least you don't need it right now. And it doesn't even look like this guy lives any sort of over-the-top, luxurious lifestyle. I mean, yeah, sure, he flies around private. So what? He's got a girlfriend in Hawaii. I'm sure he's got a sick mansion out there in Newport. But 
I mean, other than that, there's there's not a whole lot to it. So the 17 questions about Shohei Otani's extremely large contract. Otani and the Los Angeles Dodgers just agreed to one of the most unusual deals in MLB history with an unprecedented $680 million in deferred money. Why did they structure it this way? And will it give rise to a new trend in baseball? On Saturday, I wrote about Shohei Otani's new deal with the Los Angeles Dodgers. The story ran under the headline, Shohei Otani's $700 million Dodgers contract is unlike anything in MLB history. Two days later, we learned additional details. And although the headline holds up, it reads differently now. In one sense, Otani's tenure pact is actually less of an outlier than it first appeared. In another sense, it's even further from the realm of what any other player could dream of, let alone command. Soon after news broke that Otani had signed, ESPN's Jeff Passett reported that most of the money in the deal would be deferred. As it turns out, most was an understatement. Here's the new kicker after relatives after after rev, relatives revelations on Monday. 680 of the 700 million dollars will be deferred. That's 97%. The Dodgers will pay him 2 million dollars in each of the next 10 seasons through 2033. Then they'll owe him $68 million in each of the first 10 years after that through 2043. Otani has been vowing, excuse me, wowing people with his play ever since he turned pro. And days after wowing the baseball world with his contract's top line figure, he did it again with the finer print was published. When the finer print was published, one thing is clear. We should never underestimate Otani's capacity to surprise. By his contract's implications are much murkier and are essentially misunderstood. Is Otani unaffordable or deeply discounted? Has he turned heel or become a bigger baby face of baseball than before? Is this a signing model for the future? Let's clear some... Let's clear up some misconceptions, explain some competitive ramifications, and assess some long-term effects by asking and answering 17 questions about signing number 17 to a drastically deferred deal. Start with question number one. Wait, you can do that? You can definitely do that. Article XVI, that's 16. I know that because Joe Montana and the San Francisco 49ers, their first Super Bowl was Super Bowl 16. Of the MLB collective bargaining agreement says there shall be no limitations on either the amount of deferred compensation or the percentage of total compensation attributed to deferred compensation for which a uniform player's contract may provide. In other words, defer freely. Number two, are you sure? It seems sketchy. Shouldn't Rob Manford veto it and make Otani sign with my team? I'm sure he shouldn't. Number three, what does this mean for the Dodgers' competitive balance tax? So this is a great question. If you're just joining us from fandom or some other major American sport, you may be surprised to learn that MLB doesn't have a salary cap and related news MLB players do have a strong union. However, the league employs a spending suppressing soft cap. Every dollar spent over the certain payroll threshold is subject to tax penalties. Since enough pricey free agents and the owner incurs some extra costs, the average annual value of each player's salary counts towards the team's total competitive balance tax assessment. When part of a player's salary is deferred, though, their AAV for CBT purposes is adjusted for infl inflation and depreciation. A dollar today doesn't buy what it would have 20 years ago. And a dollar 20 years from now won't buy what it does today. Though $68 million 20 years from now should still get you something good. If Otani were slated to make $700 million over 10 years, his AAV and CBT salary would be $70 million. A big chunk of change considering CBT penalties start at 237 in 2024. 
Thanks to the time value of money, though, and a 4.43% interest rate, MLB and the union using this offseason, Otani's AAV for CBT purposes is only $46 million. Only, that is. That's a big deal, though. It cuts it significantly and allows the Dodgers plenty of room to go ahead and continue to sign other guys. The Dodgers will probably add payroll now and between now and opening day. Otani's surgically re-repaired elbow will prevent him from pitching next season. And the Dodgers staff has holes, but as of now, they're still projected to be below the lowest CBT threshold, even with their latest, greatest superstar. It says, so wait, the Dodgers didn't exploit a CBD loophole here. No, not at all, which is probably the biggest false belief about Otani's singular salary structure. This isn't an MLB equivalent to the NHL's disallowed Ayla Kovalchuk contract in which a team tries to tack on years to artificially lower the AAV. MLB teams have considered such a tactic. That makes sense. The Padres reportedly thought about it offering Aaron Judge a 14-year deal last winter. The Phillies reportedly contemplated a 20-year offer for Bryce Harper. Should a team try to circumvent the CBA by pushing the envelope on length, the commissioner would have to weigh whether to strike the deal down. Yeah. I mean, really, you go, right? Let's just say you took Bryce Harper, or even Otani in this case, and you go, okay, we're going to sign Otani to a 10 or 20 year, $700 million contract in which in the first 10 years or in the 20, that significantly lowers his, his CBA. So they could have done that. And that's almost really what they did, right? Just another way of doing it. Because if you did it that way, the AAV, instead of 70 is 35. If you go 20 years that's what they should have to do. Huh. And then the player could make the deal up front and say, this, this is like, look, you'll get X amount in the first 10 years. The problem is that you get into the later years and what? They're going to pay him a dollar a year and whatever. And I, there's, the commissioner's got to be the one to say, yo, th- this is not in good faith. This doesn't make sense obviously trying to lower the salary tax threshold, luxury tax threshold that is, but the luxury tax threshold, I mean, fuck that anyway. That's not capitalism. It sucks. So it says only $460 million for Otani. I thought this guy was good. This is the next question. Okay. I'm not sure anyone is saying only 460 million, but that total does seem smaller after anchoring on 700 million. Look, it's 700 fucking million. The 460 million as just a, a way to manipulate it, and we're trying to project out of inflation and everything else. So, yes, 46 million a year is what is going to be tacked on to the luxury tax threshold for the Dodgers. Uh, how does this structure help the Dodgers? Primarily because Otani is taking home only two million dollars in annual salary for the next decade. Otani will wear number 17 on the field for the Dodgers next season. He's also number 17 on the list of projected 2024 Dodgers salaries just ahead of Yancey Almonte. Even though his CBT figure is sizable, the Dodgers' yearly exponential on him will be minuscule for the time being, which will help them pay other players. The team may have had some assurances that it would, according to a source cited by Tom Verducci. Otani asked for language in his contract that assures the club will make good on its promise to use the savings he created to build a competitive team around him. The Dodgers have obviously proved that. My only question is this. What if the Dodgers go out of business? Where the fuck does that money go, right? That's risky. They go bankrupt. See ya. MLB could fold. We just don't know. It's possible. 
highly unlikely, but obviously possible. So in that case, well, I guess he'd be out six hundred and eighty million fucking dollars. Yikes! Hoping Armageddon does not come for Otani's sake. That's for sure. Okay. Why was Otani willing to do this? It's not just that he was willing to do it according to Belio. That's his agent, Nez. This structure was Otani's idea. The two-way star hasn't explained himself publicly yet, but presumably this plan appealed to him for two reasons. One, his agent insists is that Otani wants to win, as Otani said in 2021. That's the biggest thing for me. Deferring so much money makes it easier for the Dodgers to provide the strong supporting cast that Otani and Trout lacked in Anaheim. Two, Otani is uniquely well positioned to wait for a windfall because his endorsement earnings, which may be in line to increase with his move to a more successful franchise, reportedly amount to approximately $50 million a year, many times more than any other major leaguers. He'd be the best paid player in baseball if the Dodgers didn't pay him a cent. And he won't be hurting in the short term from the earnings of that meager $2 million. It's tough to imagine what he'd splurge on if he were making even more. Otani has long been portrayed and also self-described as someone who is dedicated to baseball, that he basically lives at the ballpark and the gym when he isn't sound asleep. I mean... I get it. Really important to focus on your craft and be all about ball, baseball player first. Shohei. Every now and again, you got to get out though, huh? Hop on the PJ, go to Vegas, night at the Rhino, rolling dice all night. I mean, I don't, want to tell someone else how to live their life but even tom brady who was as disciplined of an athlete that i've ever seen in my lifetime got after it every now and again i'm curious about the personal life of Shohei Otani. yeah not all the time but every once in a while if you want to go indulge in some hookers and blow i'm not going to judge you that's not my thing but Hey, that's a really, 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 really large amount of money. I mean, a fuck ton. You could do a lot of good things with that. Hookers and blow are not at the top of that list either. I'm just messing around. That's really cool, too. Like, that's what matters. Like, again, and if you could keep it out of the government's hands as much as possible... All due respect to our government, I appreciate the great paved roads that we get to drive on and all the services and law enforcement, everything else. But I'm just thinking if Shohei wants to donate to the Let Them Play Foundation, yeah, (laughs) send it our way. So I think that potentially could help as well with all that deferred money and not having to pay the taxes. Now, I'm still not... Positive that's the case because the Dodgers are going to be paying him. So you can make the argument that his services will be, I don't know, I, I but he won't be working. So he could be working outside of the state of California. Let's see if they attack this. It says, does the deal make Otani less likable? No. I mean, come on. It's just not even close. This is one of the most likable athletes that I think we've ever seen as well. What will happen when the Dodgers' big bills come, uh, yeah, this is a great question. The inner monologue of mine says an interest-free $68 million might not be an imposing a sum in 10 or 20 years, and it won't count against the CBT, but it will still be a pretty penny to devote to a player who's no longer with the Dodgers. Of course, a team has time to prepare for that, and in the meantime, the Dodgers may make tens of million dollars a year on Otani-related promotions and advertising 
which they can squirrel away and invest with those future payments in mind. In fact, they can't just forget about their future debts for a decade. The CBA specifies that each season's deferral must be fully funded by the club within two years of the season when the deferred compensation is earned. That is, the team has to show that it's good for it. Yeah. A more exciting scenario than the Dodgers simply saving and spending responsibly would involve Otani adding owner to pitcher and hitter by turning all those IOUs into equity of the team. Yes. Now we're talking. Active players are not allowed to own a piece of the franchise, though, but ex players are permitted to buy into an ownership group, as Derek Jeter did with the Marlins and Buster Posey did with the Giants. What the fuck, man? I had my shot. And I didn't back away from it. Honestly, I did. Had a shot to get in. Had a group to get in. The franchise value at the time was $1 billion. And this is years ago. And the stake was $8 million. For 1% of the team. And I communicated with the necessary people that I'm in. Now, eight large like that, I was going to do half of it. I had another buddy that was doing the other half. We're going to go in as one entity. And that was it. And then the deal went away. What happens is when it came up, other owners have first right of refusal. And so these percentages get sold off often. And if another owner wants to grab it, they can. So in the case where I had the opportunity to buy in, there was another owner that took it first. And what team was that? You may ask. I'm not sure. I should be revealing this highly confidential information here on the Deuces Wild Daily Hustle, but fuck it. It is no filter network. The San Francisco Giants was a team. Yes, and where would have my money gone or where would it be now? It, it The franchise is valued. It's got to be at like two, three billion at, at least. I way, way more than that. The Clippers to, sold for fuck it too. It's got to be at three. So I probably would have like tripled my money, maybe even four. Now, it also, this, this also isn't money that you, you're getting out, right? So you could get out for 80% of it, but for the most part, it's money you let ride. And I was more excited with whatever sort of board role I could have had to help the franchise. So on that note, if you're a team out there and you're looking for any sort of ownership partner, I'm all in. Let me know. I just need to... Uh, Go ahead and find the money. That's it. Or partner with it. Do extreme deferrals pose a problem for competitive balance? In theory, not particularly. Sure, the Dodgers were already good and adding Otani makes them better, but it's not as if they could sign superstars without accounting tricks. And again, they're supposedly weren't the only team that Otani would have deferred for. I got to imagine he was deferring for everybody. And then will a situation like Otani's arise again? We've all been asking the question for some time, though. Usually as it pertains to Otani's two-way play, this situation is closely related to Otani's unicorn status, though it's sort of the same question. Will there be any other Otanis? There isn't that much value to teams in deferring pay for players who don't make much money, and most players won't want to do it. No matter how much they make, Max Scherzer's 50% deferral rate with the Nationals was a sport's previous high. As Tim Dirks of MLB Trade Rumor wrote, one player doing it does not translate to a hot button issue or something where billions of dollars hang in the balance, especially when that one player is a one of one. Put it all together, and this doesn't seem like a very pressing problem, except perhaps for the Dodgers divisional ranks. What's Otani's dog name? This is question. We're all the way at question 16 now, by the way. Sorry, we still don't know. 
but he probably has a deferred contract. Wow, wow, wow. Ba bang. That's a good one. That's really fucking. I mean, I'm not one to think the dad jokes, dumb, whatever. That's a good one. Chloe, my oldest daughter, Peanut, she likes the dad jokes. Me, not into them. It's interesting how we all in the family have very, very different senses of humor. Uh, don't dogs of that breed have hair, not fur? Just let me have my pun, he says. Good article. Who wrote this? This is on the ringer. Ah, oh, Ben Lindbergh. Yeah, dude, Ben Lindbergh's great. All right. So, in summation with Otani, and then we'll move on. Number one, $70 million for somebody that is primarily a DH, will not play a position in 2024, and certainly will not pitch in 2024. If he comes back in 2025 and he's a fantastic pitcher, okay, this makes a little bit more sense. And the easiest way to break it down is that a five-win player is worth roughly $30 million a year. So if you took the 30 to 35 on that five-win player, from an offensive perspective, which what Otani was, and a five-win player on the mound, which what Otani was, then you got your $70 million player. That makes sense. But what doesn't make sense is that he may not ever pitch again. This is his second Tommy John surgery. They're supposed to have a shelf life of like six years. So even if he does pitch again, there's still a chance at the end of the contract he's back out on that too. So his value, actually, if the arm does hold up, could, and this is the, this is the great thing about it, because if you're not getting the value with the bat, you're definitely, and, and he's healthy and he could pitch, you're going to get it with the arm. I mean, this guy could do whatever. He could fucking close. He's a righty. I'm sure he could probably throw fucking lefty if you ask him to. I just, one of the most talented athletes our world has ever seen. Let's not forget this because I bring up the fact that he's a DH and you have the offensive value. If you put Otani in the field and let him run out there for 160 games, his defensive statistics are going to be through the roof. Now, have they been in the past? I don't think they have. But he also has sparingly played out there. So how can you expect them to get great reads and great jumps on the ball and all the other bullshit? This is the second or third fastest guy in all of Major League Baseball. So if his wing is busted and he never pitches again for whatever reason, then you go all in on making this dude an outfielder and one of the better outfielders in baseball. I know, we know, just from what we've seen, he's got the ability to do it. Uh, other than that, good on the Dodgers. That's an international fucking superstar. Since Babe Ruth, this is the biggest superstar that we've ever seen. Bonds was huge. He was on his own planet. I'm trying to think who else in our lifetime. I mean, you've got Willie Mays. Obviously, is someone that's come to mind. Jackie Robinson, the fact that he transcended the game of baseball and breaking the color barrier. Shohei Otani, when it's all said and done, will go towards the top of that list. Will he be at the top of the list? I don't know. I think there's an advantage of being the first mover or the first comer in this case, where Babe Ruth will always be synonymous with baseball. But after that, it's a very short list, and you will hear Willie Mays. And then the next name or a name right towards the top of that list is going to be Shohei Otani.
be fun to see how this whole thing plays out. All right. Onward and upward here. Because I watched that Instagram video of Patrick Mahomes after the game. Shaking hands with Josh Allen. And saying, man... That's crazy, craziest call I've ever seen. And then immediately goes into this tirade, whining and complaining about the offsides call that clearly was offsides on what would have been a game-winning touchdown for the Chiefs. My number one thought was, what a fucking bitch. Why would Patrick Mahomes be complaining to Josh Allen? You think he gives a fuck? No. Not one little bit. Everybody goes through it, man. This isn't a coup to hold down the Chiefs. Patrick Mahomes is the face of the NFL. If anything, the guy's going to get favorable calls along the way. Well, what really upset Mahomes, and I know we've all been there before, is you go back to the previous week and the non-call on the pass interference play that would have won the Chiefs game. That was obviously resonating with him since that day. And here we are a week later on another suspect call. And it was suspect. Well, excuse me. It wasn't. On another call, though, that if you're Mahomes, you're like, dude, just fucking let it play. Is it that big of a deal? Didn't happen that way. The refs made the correct call as they should have. And then after that, you saw the unraveling because... They still had, what, at least a few more plays to be able to convert, and they didn't. And Mahomes was visually upset. It's one of those things where as soon as the bad call happened, it was just fucking over. It was right. As soon, not the bad call. As soon as the offsides called happened, it was done. Well, <sighs> Mahomes knows this as well as anybody. You got to let go, man. You cannot hold on to it. And yes, I understand why he would be frustrated. I understand the Chiefs have not been playing well. I understand they got screwed out of the victory from last week because of the non-pass interference call. But this goes back to what I said in the beginning about this with Josh Allen. Dude, as a competitor... And as somebody who knows and understands what you go through on a weekly basis, you should know better than anybody that he doesn't give a fuck about a call that they actually got right that benefited his team. That's the wrong guy to complain to. As a matter of fact, if I'm Alan... It's like, whatever, dude. Fuck is wrong with you? So, Mahomes seems like an awesome guy. I, I'm not going to come on here and rip him and what, you know. I, I'm going to 100% write it off as a heat of the moment sort of thing. I was not shocked to see this. Patrick Mahomes, article today, says he regrets the outburst and the interaction with Josh Allen. Given time to reflect on his sideline outburst as the official's Sunday and his post-game interaction with Buffalo Bills quarterback Josh Allen, Kansas City Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes says he regrets his actions. Mahomes was heated Sunday after an offside call on the Chiefs receiver Kadarius Toney negated what would have been the go-ahead touchdown with less than two minutes remaining. Tony took a cross field lateral from Travis Kelsey, who caught a pass from Mahomes 
and completed what would have been a 49-yard touchdown. After the penalty, Mahomes proceeded to throw incomplete on three straight plays, and the Bills ran out the clock to win 20-17. to Lost in all this was the ballsy throw by Travis Kelsey. What a fucking savage. Talk about somebody that clearly does not give a fuck. He is the poster boy for let them play baseball. Free and fearless, baby. That is incredible. He had this ball. And to have the whereabouts to just randomly look across the field to Tony as he's about to get tackled and fires a dime right to him. And Tony, you could tell he was frustrated because he had gotten tied up with one of the defenders and then the ball didn't come his way. He wasn't expecting this. This wasn't any sort of designed or called play. It was just Travis Kelsey literally in the backyard playing a Thanksgiving Day family football game and fucking around with his brother. That's it. So it would have been the play of the year. Sports Center still gave it a ton of love and, you know, as they should have. All right. So it says Mahomes was heated Sunday after an onside call at Chiefs Canaries. Time to get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. I'm trying to get this part of it. A WROC TV camera caught Mahomes telling Allen, wildest fucking call I've ever seen. Offensive offsides on that play, man. Fucking terrible. Fucking terrible. Just how about nah the right fucking call? As a matter of fact, Mahomes said Monday, I was still hot and emotional, but you can't do that. It's not a great example for kids watching the game. I was more upset about that than me on the sidelines. On Sunday, Mahomes said he asked three different officials about the call and never received a response. And said after the game, another game we're talking about the refs. It's not what we want for the NFL. I mean, yes, that is true. You don't want to be talking about the refs at the end of the game. If Mahomes was really to get that upset, it should have been the week before on the no pass interference call. That was the call they fucked up. This was... Black and white. Anybody, a third grader could have called this fucking ball. I mean, you could tell his whole head was over the ball. All right. It says, quote, obviously I've seen it now. And if he didn't check and they weren't good, it is a foul. So you got to check. I know this from playing high school football. You're a receiver and you're on the ball receiver. You walk up, you get on the ball. And you, you, you look at the ref, you're like, dude, I'm good. I'm good. Cool. Because there's been times where you kind of get on the ball. You're like, I'm good. He's like, no, nah, back it up. You're like, okay, cool. But you want to make sure that you're actually on the ball. Um, honey, this is my wife calling. Does she not understand? I'm on the DH. Hmm. Uh, it is something you rarely see called in the NFL. But it was a foul. It's part of playing the game, man. You learn from it. It's part of being a person. You learn from your mistakes and try to be better next time. Earlier Monday, Chiefs coach Andy Reid said that Tony did not check with the silent official to make sure he was lined up correctly. Asked what his coaching advice to Tony will be this week. Reid said, just make sure you check. Make sure you check with a guy on the side just to see if you're aligned. Again, this is something you do in peewee football. He was two inches away from, or an inch from being legal. He was not an inch. I mean, it looked like it fucking, he was like a foot. Mahomes might be subject to a fine from the NFL for his actions and comments and said Monday that he would accept any punishment that comes his way. Quote, you have to accept the consequences of your actions. And that's something that I've always stood by. I obviously didn't act in a way that I usually act. And if there's consequences that come from that, I obviously accept us. Good on Mahomes. What a stand-up dude. 
really. I, I, I love that guy. He is... I, I, as frustrating and are as frustrated as he was. So you have to remember too, in the moment we we all get to see that Tony was off sides. Mahomes doesn't. He just probably figured that, you know, this is a penalty that came down to an inch and there it was. And then after the play happens, I mean, what's the ref supposed to do? Pick up the fucking flag. You can't do it. They made the right call. So this is good. Tommy DeVito's agent looks exactly how you'd expect him to look. And NFL fans had all the jokes. So Tommy DeVito is a New York Giants quarterback that led them to a victory over the Green Bay Packers last night. He lives at home with his mom out there in, let's see, is I mean, somewhere in New York. Yeah, no, it's in New Jersey. It's the fact that he lives at his parents' home in New Jersey and he commutes to the MetLife or the fact that he seems like a walking, talking curry catcher, New Jersey curry catcher who has earned the nickname Tommy Cutlets. This is so good. He's becoming a fan favorite both among Giants and NFL viewers at large. Okay, so uh, let me start the article over. Though he began the year as a third-string quarterback, Tommy DeVito has quickly made a name for himself since ascending to his starting role with the New York Giants due to injuries to Daniel Jones and Tyrod Taylor. Whether it's the fact that he lives at his parents' home in New Jersey or commutes to MetLife Stadium or the fact that he seems like a walking, talking carry catcher. I mean, I, this is so... All right. I already went over that. Shortly before the Giants' Monday Night Football game against... The Green Bay Packers, DeVito was spotted on the sidelines chatting with his agent, who looks exactly like you would expect him to. You ready for this? This is too fucking good. I mean, come on. This is straight out of Goodfellas, Sopranos, yeah, whatever. It says, I mean, come on. He looks like he's a character straight out of Sopranos. And you probably would expect NFL fans, and they had a lot of jokes. Here's some of the tweets. Tommy DeVito's agent looks exactly how I'd expect Tommy DeVito's agent to look. Of course, this is Tommy DeVito's agent. Italian pride has never been higher in New York and New Jersey since the final season of The Sopranos. Tommy DeVito's agent dressing like Uncle Junior from The Sopranos is my favorite thing ever. If you think that's wild, just wait until you find out that this guy is the head of security for Tommy DeVito's family. I mean, geez. If you ask an AI generator to come up with Tommy DeVito's agent, I think this is the image he would create. On and on and on. So, big win by the Giants last night. And how about the win that the Titans pulled off? This was crazy. Will Levis led two touchdown drives in the final four minutes and 34 seconds. To help the Titans come back from a 27 to 13 deficit to beat the Miami Dolphins 28 27 on Monday Night Football at Hard Rock Stadium. I'm jacked. Jacked. That was awesome. Levis said after completing 23 of 38 passes, 327 yards for his first 300 yard career passing day. Titans tight end Chick Okinawa added, We just pulled out a win out of nowhere. I don't know what to say. It's an awesome feeling. Just how far out was Tennessee? These numbers are crazy. The Titans entered the game as 13 and a half point dogs. So a 13 and a half point dog winning, it's not that big of a deal. And losers of six, all six of their road games before Monday night. According to ESPN, they had a 49.2% chance to win when the game was tied 13 13 in the fourth quarter before a muffed punt led to the Dolphins running back Raheem Mozart's first touchdown with 534 left. They had a 0.7% chance to win after the fumble, which turned into Mostert's second touchdown that pushed Miami's lead to 27-13 with 434 left. That figure dropped even lower to 0.4%, according to Next Gen Stats, during the Titans' comeback attempt. Quote, did nobody think we were going to win? Everybody thought we were 
going to come in and probably be another Miami Broncos seeing 70 points put up on us. Titans outside linebacker Arden Key said, referencing the Dolphins 70-20 win over Denver earlier this season. We don't care about the outside noise and why the fuck should you? You guys just do you. That game scared me. And obviously late in, you know, when they had a 0.7% chance or 0.4% chance. We were on the Dolphins yesterday. We had the Dolphins in a teaser for the game. And we had the Dolphins in, so the teaser we were giving up, they were 13 and a half, so six points. So what is that, seven and a half? So we were giving up seven and a half. And we went ahead and teased that with, I think it was the Giants last night. So it didn't come in. We had Miami in the second half too. So that's where, you know, it it definitely hit us hard. That is the degenerate gambling uh, club that I'm a part of in which uh, Giuseppe Pepe Manuelli and uh, otherwise known as Joey Meatballs and then Johnny Donuts is my other partner in the degenerate gambling operation where we legally lay action wherever and whenever we can. All right. Will the thrill on tonight at 8 p.m. Central time. That's thrills time. 6 p.m. Pacific. That's my time. East Coast, we're going 9 p.m. We'll be on for anywhere between 60 and 90 minutes. The question is going to be, where do the Giants go from here now that they did not land Otani. The offseason is amongst us. What were Will's offseason drills that he would do? We're going to talk hitting. We're going to talk hitting mechanics. And also, we will, of course, rip open at least one, if not multiple, packs of 1987 tops. My favorite year. And then just turn it over to Will for story time when it comes to a Todd Morrell, a Ron Kittle, or Tom Nieto. Uh, how about a Rob Wilfong, Sammy Stewart, Alfredo Griffin, Lonnie Smith, Raphael Belliard. I mean, how great are these, dude? Charlie Huff. Look at old Charlie. The knuckleballer. Looking no younger than 73. Mike Brown. Bill Sure, Tom Foley, and we'll ask Will about this guy, Raphael Palmieri. All right, coming up tonight, 6 p.m. Pacific, No Filter Network. Everyone have a fantastic day. If you're listening on Apple, you're listening on Spotify, please do us a favor. Leave us a review. Uh, if you could hit the five stars, if you're feeling generous, it is the Christmas season. We'd greatly appreciate it. As much as I hate to say it, the ratings do fucking matter. And it involves uh, where and how often we get promoted. And just, it really helps. It really, really helps. And more importantly, most importantly, it helps us continue to create. So if you guys could do that, um, thank you very much. And then also, if you are listening on Apple or Spotify and you want to watch this live, typically every single morning, we are anywhere between 8, I used to say 8 and 10 a.m. 8 and 11 a.m. Pacific time is when I'll schedule the show. A lot of times I schedule it the day of because I, I don't want to schedule something where I know I can't commit. But that's the window in which I come on here for a daily hustle, create about an hour of content, and then it gets uploaded to all the other platforms afterwards, uh, including Caffeine TV and Fubo, if you guys are watching there. Uh Thank you guys. And come join us on No Filter Network for the live interactive Will the Thrill Deuces Wild tonight. Everyone have a fantastic day. See ya!